All right. Welcome, everyone. This is Dr. Clark from the Center for Weight Loss Success. Today on Losing Weight USA, we're going to talk about something that has been flying around social media for the past literally year, I guess, maybe even a little longer. And we're talking about injectable medications for weight loss, both semaglutide as well as terzepatide. Semaglutide, you may have heard of it, often called Wigovi. That's the brand name. Terzepatide is uh, Monjaro, which the, both of these medications were developed for treatment of diabetes type 2. Um, but they found that it works wonderfully for weight loss as well. So we're going to talk about the new injectable medications for weight loss. All right, welcome to Losing Weight USA, real-time answers to your weight loss questions. Some of the latest updates as uh, well as a little bit of expert advice. Gives you direct access not only to me, but you should be receiving the health tips and recipes via the membership portal. And I encourage you, get into the membership portal. We keep updating, adding more and more things. All right, each of these webinars will last about half hour or so. If you have questions, type them in, in the chat box as we go along. We'll get to them at the end. If you think of things once we're all done, just give us a yell here at the Center for Weight Loss Success. The email is success at cfwls.com. Phone number 757-873-1880. All right, so let's get the slides going. All right, here we go. All right, so again, we're talking about some of these new injectable medications been around over the past year or so, a lot of kind of uh, excitement over social media. So it's semaglutide and terzepatide. Um, both of these medications are kind of out, they're talked about. Yep, they're really, really expensive if you've been, if you've looked into that. So if you're paying for them, you literally could pay, you know, thousand two thousand dollars a month um all of the prices starting to come down and we have gotten some access to lower price medications um that can that will be utilized and so subsequently it shouldn't cost any more um like that thousand two thousand dollars no it's going to be maybe a few hundred dollars but still it's starting to get into what i'll call at least an acceptable rate all right, so this is weight loss. All right, weight loss is hard. You all know that. Okay, weight maintenance, though, is actually even harder. But again, don't despair. There's actually a couple of new medications out there. They're medications that are given as a once a week injection, similar to like giving yourself an insulin injection. And these medications, very, very effective, kind of what we're seeing there in these early studies. And we'll kind of go through what we'll typically see. All right, so the two medications are semaglutide and terzepatide. Semaglutide is often referred to as Wigovi. That's, you know, here it talked about, you hear it advertised, marketed. Terzepatide is a little newer, so you don't hear as much about it, but it's uh, what is uh, Manjaro, which is the brand name there. So just a little background in there. They're both developed for treatment of type 2 diabetes. So in June of 2021, so we're talking a little less than two years ago, the FDA approved kind of semaglutide for weight loss. Okay, it was already approved for diabetes type 2 as uh, Ozempic, um, but this is now as a different uh, dose called Wigovi. Um, so it's approved for weight loss in adults. Early studies. In the early studies, and again, realize all of these studies are going to be relatively early because they haven't, these medications haven't been around for that long. The early studies are showing about 15 to 18 percent body weight loss over 12 to 16 months. So 15 percent of body weight loss. So if you weigh 200 pounds, 15 percent would be 30 pounds. Okay. And typically that occurs over a period of time and sometimes a long, relatively long period of time, 12 to 16 months, but we do see very good weight loss. And just to put this in comparison, typically most weight loss medications that are pills and things like that, they'll typically show five to 10% weight loss when you look at them carefully. So this is a significant step in the right direction, kind of closing in, not really on what I'll call surgical weight loss, which sometimes is about 25% of body weight um, or even more. 
And of course, these medications work best with when you're doing the right things to lose weight, meaning that you're on a reduced calorie diet, you're increasing physical activity, you're basically doing the healthy things to make these medications work well. Medication, this is a, just a generality. Medications all by themselves typically don't work that great. This isn't that different in that, yes, you still have to do all the right things. So semaglutide, again, been around for a couple of years. Terzepatide, or the Manjaro, you know, terzepatide is you know, less than a year. So in May of 2022, so just less than a year ago, the FDA approved the treatment for type 2 diabetes. Presently, it's not approved for weight loss. That doesn't mean it can't be used for weight loss. It is used for weight loss, but it's presently used what we refer to as off-label. Um, reportedly, the FDA has the terzepatide on fast track to actually get approved for weight loss, but presently it's being used as off-label for weight loss. Now, the early studies with this, again, they're in early studies, they're showing over 20% body weight loss for people who are on this medication for an extended period of time. So early studies showing 20% or over 20%. So 20% is weight, two, you know, to weigh 200 pounds, 20% is 40 pounds. So now we're talking again, very significant weight loss that we're seeing. Again, best used with a low calorie diet, exercise activity, that kind of thing. So yes, you still need to do all the right things. It's just not, the weight just magically falls off, which we like to happen. All right, so what are these actual medications? Okay, where do they come, you know, what do they actually do? Okay, we'll talk about semaglutide as well as terzepatide. Semaglutide, um, again, been around for a couple of years. It's an injectable Glucagon-like peptide, which we refer to as GLP, so GLP-1 agonist. So what it does is it increases that that time. And GLP-1 is what's referred to as an in, excuse me, incretin hormone. Incretin hormone means that it's made by the GI tract, yes, the intestinal tract. And so subsequently, then it's released by some of the cells along the intestinal tract. And so subsequently then it can help with different, different things, okay? The, this is an injectable uh, medication just given once a week. So typically just once a week it's given. The half-life of this medication is fairly long. I mean, it's over 200 hours. So literally it sticks around for a period of time. Terzepatide, okay, similar. It also mimics that GLP-1 kind of, uh, so it's uh, a GLP-1 agonist, which increases then these incretin hormone, but it also is, uh, it increases GIP. GIP is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. Okay? Both of these can help with weight loss, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute kind of about uh, how that actually works. Now, again, presently, this is just treatment for type 2 diabetes, this is terzepatide, but it is placed on the FDA fast track designation. So weight loss presently again is off label, but it works wonderfully. Both of these medications, as you probably realize, and, or if you've looked at them at all, there's been kind of supply issues, supply chain issues. Of can you get the medications? Can you not get the medications? That's slowly being worked out. And hopefully over the next year, those supply chain issues will slowly go away. But presently, they still exist. And sometimes the medications can be, it's not like I can just say, I want the medication. Here it is. Go down to the pharmacy, get it. Not quite that simple. But there are ways that we can uh, work with some of the compounding pharmacies that will actually keep it relatively, we can get good access to this. Okay. Both of these medications, again, semaglutide, terzepatide, they're both indicated to treat type 2 diabetes, okay, not type 1 diabetes. So type 2, type 1 diabetes, you don't make any insulin. Type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. 
but we also find it works wonderfully for weight loss and it's indicated for weight loss for anyone that has a body mass index over 30, which is typically a good 25, 30 pounds overweight or body mass index over 27 with some medical problems such as cholesterol problems, inflammatory problems, um, diabetes also. Um, they do need to be refrigerated, so you just can't keep them on the uh, They need to kind of keep uh, kept out of direct sunlight as well. So in the refrigerator, which keeps them out of sunlight as well. All right, so kind of that's just kind of an introduction of what they do. So how do these medications actually work? Okay, and this is kind of the, the critical aspect. They work in multiple areas. They work on your brain. They work on your whole body, they work on your pancreas, as well as they work on your stomach itself, okay? So how they actually work, this GIP and the GLP-1, okay? How do these little incretin hormones work? So on the brain, basically they work to help decrease um, food intake. So basically making satiety much easier to obtain. So reduce food intake, I'm not, I get full easier, so therefore I subsequently eat less. Now, on the whole body, okay, it tends to increase insulin sensitivity. And this is extremely important because if we can, if we can increase insulin sensitivity, that means that people are no longer so insulin resistant. We talk about, you know, carbohydrate sensitivity, insulin resistance literally all the time on this webinar. And so subsequently, if we, this is one of the first medications that actually can help increase insulin sensitivity. Other things that help, you know, exercise, kind of low carb diet. All. So some of the things we talk about, which are very difficult to do, um, in theory, kind of there are a couple of oral medications, they just don't work well. So this is one of the first medications that actually shows some real improvement in increasing insulin sensitivity or decreasing insulin resistance, we could call that. And because of this, I'm really excited about the potential for keeping weight off is going to be better because for just like every you know, medication for weight loss in the world, um, every medication, every plan for, for diet control of weight is that typically once you go off the plan, and whether you stopped your diet, whether you stopped exercising, whether you stopped kind of, um, doing or taking a medication or whatever it was, typically weight returns back to where your starting point was. If we can actually improve this insulin sensitivity, so make, meaning insulin resistance is not so bad, then the weight maintenance side of this whole thing may be a lot easier. Now I said maybe because again, those long-term studies don't exist at this time, but this is one of the parts of this that I'm really excited about. All right, pancreas. Okay. So it also works on the pancreas. And then pancreas typically, it actually increases insulin um, secretion. Now, we talk about insulin secretion all the time. So in insulin secretion, we generally say, hey, you want to control insulin secretion. So how could this actually help with weight loss then? If we're increasing insulin, because I talk about all the time, is when insulin levels go up, it's harder to lose weight because insulin turns on fat storage. So if these medications actually increase kind of the insulin levels, well, here's where it's kind of different. It does increase insulin levels, but what it does, it helps with that carbohydrate sensitivity. If you recall at all from our previous discussions, carbohydrate sensitivity, typically there's a delay. There's a delay in that insulin release, which allows the blood sugar to go way high. Then you get a big insulin release, and so subsequently then the blood sugar plummets, and you get this you know, roller coaster ride. So the GIP and the G GLP-1 agonist, this activity, if it actually helps with that carbohydrate sensitivity, meaning that we increase the insulin level appropriately. And so we have that carbohydrate, there's not that delay in the insulin response. Subsequently, then you're not going to get that great big blood sugar swing up and subsequently not the plummet either. It's going to smooth some of this over. And yes, insulin levels, even though they go up, won't go up as high. 
the subsequently this is. I mean, it seems like it's almost backwards from what I often talking about, but no, this actually can be helpful. And then finally, it actually works on your stomach too. And this part is where we're going to talk about side effects in just a, a minute here. But this is part of where um, people often will notice that, hey, what do I feel when I take this medication? One, part of it, it's working on the brain. I don't I feel satisfied. I don't need them. I don't get as hungry as much. But part of it is also it slows down gastric emptying. And if it slows down gastric emptying, it means that, okay, food can just sit in the stomach a little bit longer. And subsequently, then I won't eat as much and I won't get hungry as soon. And that's a physical slowing down of the stomach actually emptying there. And if we do that, then we tend to eat less. Now, part of that, though, if we do that, can lead to certain side effects, which we're going to talk about um, as we go along here. All right. So what are those side effects? And just to put that out there, about five, a little over 5%, 5 to 8% of people that try to utilize these medications may not be able to tolerate the side effects. And part of it is just this is how some of the medications work. Um, so they don't tolerate it quite as well. For most people, though, it's just adjusting the dose and adjusting the way they're eating and acting with food. So some of these side effects are truly related to slowing down the gastric emptying. Or slowing down the gastric emptying, potentially, you may be more sensitive to more nausea. Could you actually get some diarrhea, which sounds counterintuitive. It's like, gee, if we're slowing down gastric emptying, we ought to slow down. We might be more prone to constipation. But studies have not actually shown that. There are people are more tend to be a little more prone to loose bowel movements is more likely than constipation. But just like every medication in the world, diarrhea, constipation can be a side effect of these things. So could you get nausea? Then also vomiting. Okay, could typically this is more of a behavior thing. It's like, okay, you have to change your behavior. You have to eat slow, cut things up small, take your time. Very similar to a post-surgery type of eating plan. You've got to slow down, eat less. Don't, if you're going fast, eating big bites, all that, you're going to, you know, sometimes set this off, which then brings us to kind of abdominal pain or just straight forward indigestion, burping, um, uh, it could be heartburn as well. Some of these things, they are kind of, they can be easily treated, but also kind of it, you know, by changing the eating behavior is going to help with treating these things. About 2% of people are going to just have fatigue. That's a common side effect of many medications. That's generally not something that's going to stop people from taking it though. Now, a couple things that's very, that are very, part of, if you want to call that, of just weight loss in general, is that when people lose weight fairly quickly, whether you're in a diet plan, where you've had surgery, whether, there is a slight increased risk of gallbladder problems. And that goes along just with weight loss. And the faster the weight loss, the more the weight loss makes it a little more likely. So weight loss in itself can bring about gallbladder problems, whether it's actually related to the actual medication it could be, but it's actually more likely due to the, the weight loss itself. And then if, if we're slowing down gastric emptying, for slowing down gastric emptying, you do have to wonder kind of what happens to certain medications. Will certain medications then be a little more poorly absorbed because they're just sitting in the stomach, not going through the intestinal tract? Most medications are typically absorbed in the intestinal tract, not necessarily in the stomach itself, okay? But if we slow down gastric emptying, there is that potential. Could there be poor absorption of other uh, medications? Birth control is just one of those that, that, that we contemplate whether that would be absorbed poorly or not. And my answer to that is, well, you probably need to use a different form of birth control till we kind of get some idea of is it affecting you that way or not, okay? So kind of there are some things that are potential. Most of these things um, aren't going to be severe side effects, and they're actually something people can work with. And also, if, if we adjust the dosing appropriately, it'll be more likely to be well tolerated. 
Bottom line to this, in any new medication, if you develop severe side effects, if you've got a serious allergy, allergic reaction to it, or feel like, hey, my heart's racing, all this, then yeah, you need to seek medical attention. That's no different than any other new medication you, you take that potentially can cause side effects. Is it likely to cause these things? No, not at all. All right, there is probably a certain portion of the population that should not use these medications. And I'm going to go through this list with you, but there are a, a, a small portion of the population, they shouldn't use this medication, shouldn't even think about doing it. If, and this is really, really rare, because I've never seen this in my 30 years of practice, if you or family history of medullary thyroid cancer or multiple endocrine neoplasia, or medullary thyroid cancer is called MTC, multiple endocrine neoplasia is MEN. And the, the thought here is that we they have noted that in rodents that were utilized to study this medication, they became a little more prone to some weird thyroid tumors. It has not been shown to be true in humans, but because of this, anyone that has a personal or family history of these very odd thyroid tumors shouldn't take the medication. Now, other people that shouldn't take the medication, if you're a type 1 diabetic, I mentioned that earlier, if you're a type 1 a diabetic, no, you don't, you shouldn't take this medication. Or if you have a history of diabetic retinopathy, now, it's not that the medications would cause a worsening of the diabetic retinopathy. It's that if diabetic retinopathy is typically from high blood sugars, you know, for a long, long, long period of time, if we fix high blood sugars really quickly for someone that has diabetic retinopathy, they can actually see a little worsening of the diabetic retinopathy. And it's from the actual fixing of it. It's not the medication itself. But if we fix the, the high, really high blood sugars, bring them down the normal blood sugars too quickly, there can be a worsening of diabetic retinopathy. All right, other people, well, if you've got a history of pancreatitis, you shouldn't take this med because it works somewhat on the GI tract. Or if you already have a history of poor gastric emptying, which is referred to as gastroparesis, if you have gastroparesis, you should be very careful with this medication. So neither of these two things are, gee, you can't take the medication, but it's something you have to be watched carefully. You may not tolerate the medication well. Or if you're very prone to dehydration, and dehydration can lead to poor kidney function. So if you're really prone to dehydration, subsequently, since these medications tend to have side effect of, gee, it feels slightly nauseous, if you're not staying well hydrated, then potentially you could have a worsening if you have poor kidney function already. Obviously, I think probably don't need to say this, but I will. If you're pregnant, you shouldn't take this medication. If you're breastfeeding, you shouldn't make, take this medication. Not because we know it's really unsafe, it's because there's no studies done on it yet. And you know, during pregnancy, during breastfeeding, you gotta keep medication to an absolute minimum. Obviously, if you have an allergy to the medication, don't take it. And then finally, if you're already underweight, if you're already underweight, the last thing you need is a weight loss medication, whether it be surgery or any other medication or one of these medications. So there are certain people that shouldn't take this medication. I've listed them out here um, to encourage you, but that's pretty rare instances right there. All right, so what does the treatment process actually look like then? They're very similar. Okay, for both medications, very similar. They're weekly injections. So both semaglutide and terzepatide, basically they're weekly injections. Their dosing is a little bit different, but they're very similar concept. Weekly injections into the subcutaneous tissue, which generally means just like giving an insulin injection, which typically is a daily dose, but a, a weekly injection, just very tiny needle, put it into the subcutaneous tissue through the skin. So it's a little tiny injection, takes literally half a second. Um, but it is something that, yes, it is an injectable medication. And then we, you have to start at the very slow, very low dose. And that's true for both of these medications. Very low dose. Do that for a good month and then see how you're doing and then potentially go up to the next level of dosing. And what we're doing there is very slowly over months, 
looking at kind of at what dose do you get your best effect? And subsequently, when you get to a dose that's working well for you, meaning that, gee, I'm not getting a bunch of side effects, I'm losing weight well, and I'm trying to have a normal lifestyle, so to speak. And then subsequently, then that's the dose we'll continue to use. And not that it can't go up, that it can't go down. It's just that typically we're going to start really low, go very slow, so low and slow, and subsequently each month kind of reevaluate, hey, do you, you know, how are you doing? You know, how is your weight loss? Are you getting any side effects? And we can adjust the medication as we need to. So these medications are very slowly adjusted, and it's really to the individual of how, you know, how is it working for you? There isn't a set, you have to do this, 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 this. Um, and typically there's going to be a dose that works best for you. We just have to take our time figuring it out. Because that half-life is so long, you prefer not to make a mistake of too high a dose because you potentially could be miserable for a period of time. All right, so these, these medications, both of them, can be used long term. And uh, so it's not like, oh, you can use it for a sec, you know, only a short period of time. And one of the things with most weight loss medications that generally they're saying, oh, you can only use them for a short period of time, a few months or so. Now, that's not true with some medications, even though it's still urban legend that it's true. But these medications as well, it's not like you don't only use them for a few months. It's like, no, you can use them for an extended period of time. They tend to be relatively expensive and a big scheme of things than some other medications. All right, terzepatide, same thing. Weekly injections slowly adjust the dose for the best individual response. Um, the higher doses on there, terzepatide tends to be more expensive. It's probably not quite twice as expensive as uh, semaglutide, but it, it's fairly expensive. If you were to look up it online and say, hey, if I were to pay for this, if you went to like GoodRx, plug that app in and plug, hey, terzepatide, how much does it cost? It typically is going to be somewhere in that $1,500 to $2,000 a month. No, it doesn't need to cost that much. The higher dosing, though, will tend to be more expensive just because it's hard to get. But again, these medications can be used long term. All right, so just an example, kind of the semaglutide, which is a little different than the terzepatide, but the concept is the same. Typically with semaglutide, you'd start for the first month, first four weeks is 0 0.25 milligrams, so a tiny little dose. And subsequently, you can do well for the month. We bump you up to the next dose, which is 0.5 milligrams. Do well for that month. Bump you up to the next dose, which is one milligram. And typically, we slowly go up. The highest dose is two and a half milligrams. Okay. Um, but it's not like you have to get to the highest dose. Literally, not if you're the lowest dose, just like any medication, if we were treating your blood pressure, you'd start with a low dose of something and then potentially go up to monitor your blood pressure. If we find, hey, we need a different medication, we'd use a different medication. Similar concept here is we want to go start low, go slow, go up to that level where you're, gee, I'm not getting a whole bunch of side effects, but it's working well for me. That's what we want to do. Terzepatide, very similar, scheduled, slightly different dosing. The lowest dose is two and a half milligrams. You know, the, the semaglutide is 0.25. So the terzepatide is two and a half milligrams, all the way up to about 15 milligrams. Again, most people don't need that really high dose. They're going to use a much lower dose than that. But again, we can figure that out over time. All right, so what are the results? And I kind of mentioned the results earlier. The results are good. You know, they're really good, actually. So semaglutide, on average, about 15% of body weight is lost. Again, if you weigh 200 pounds, 15% is about 30. That's average. Some people lose more, some people lose less. Once the medication is stopped, because again, if we're doing this for weight loss, many people won't necessarily want to keep on it forever. Not that you couldn't, you could. Okay. but it's very relatively expensive then. So once the medication is stopped, what the studies are shown is about over the next year, once the medication is stopped, a regain of about 50% of what you had lost. 
Now, gee, you know, people might say, well, that doesn't sound that great. 50%, that's half of it. Well, the norm for most weight loss medications is about 95%. So 50% is a huge step in the right direction, which also, again, that's average. Some people will gain, regain more, some will regain less. And a lot of that has to do with kind of staying on track of the plan meaning that the eating activity, kind of you've got to stay on that plan. That's true with any weight loss plan. But as I mentioned right at the beginning there, if the insulin resistance really is improved, weight maintenance likely is going to be much better than many of the other medications. But again, it's not impossible to regain weight. That's true if you had surgery. That's true, you know, whatever plan you've been on. Terzepatide, a little bit better weight loss. And anecdotally, and I've talked to a lot of physicians that are utilizing this medication, anecdotally, it may have a little less chance of someone having those side effects that I mentioned earlier. So a little better weight loss, potentially a little less side effects, more expensive medication. Okay. So on average, about 20% of what uh, body weight is lost. So if you're 200, the proverbial 200 pounder, and you could lose about 40 pounds. And again, that's average. Once the medication is stopped, it's unknown. There aren't any long-term studies, so we don't know at this point. You know, is there going to be weight regain? Yes, very likely. Okay. But if that insulin resistance is improved, I think weight maintenance is going to be better, and it's going to be easier than compared to most other plans. All right, so in summary then, okay, both semaglutide, terzepatide, and that's Wagovi, Manjaro, can be very helpful for a weight loss plan. Both of them are showing really good weight loss on average. Both of them tend to be very well tolerated, minimal side effects with adjusting medications. We don't know the long-term because there are no long-term studies yet. Okay? It, so the unknown results on keeping the weight off is still out there, but it is promising. Early statistics do show some improvement of the insulin resistance, which should make it easier keeping weight off. And the bottom line is this potentially could be the answer to a lot of people's weight loss difficulties. And I think we're going to hear more and more about this over the next couple of years as supply chain issues get straightened out. The price, just like technology, the pricing will come down. It will slowly you know, get more and more common utilizing these medications. So if this is something you're interested in, okay, give us a yell here at the Center for Weight Loss Success. Again, phone number 757-873-1880. We can set up a consult, discuss this, kind of can it be utilized for yourself. The medications, again, supply chain issues are out there. Medications do have to be ordered. So it typically isn't something, well, I'll come in and I'll start doing it immediately. But we can do it relatively, when I say relatively, probably within a couple of weeks. Cost of this, it's not going to be real cheap. But as I mentioned, kind of cost, if you look it up, it's typically $1,000 to $2,000. Well, it's going to be a couple of hundred dollars. So kind of get started, get to, we actually have, ways for you to get started at a little cheaper price as well. All right, so if you have questions, I, I encourage you to pick up the phone, send an email, don't be shy. All right, don't see any questions sitting out at the moment. Again, give us a yell if you, you think of some, 757-873-1880 or email success at cfwls.com. All right, stop by the center. Get your body count done, say this all the time, log into the membership site. You should be receiving the weight loss tips as well as weekly recipes. Tune in each Tuesday, 12.15 for the next webinar. Watch your email for the invite and link. And remember, it's your life. Make it a healthy one. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.